Andrew Kelvin, kind enough to join us. Uh, Andrew covers the Canadian economy for TD Securities. Um, as I said, Andrew, I'll go through these numbers in greater detail. Looks like the loonie uh, has extended its losses after these retail sales came in below expectations. What's your reaction? It's a little bit below consensus, sure, but I don't think it's anything to be too worried about. Uh, we look at where we were through May and June. I think it was pretty clear there was a lot of pent-up demand that was driving that spending. It was a lot of people hadn't been able to go and make big-ticket purchases. They hadn't been able to buy clothing, as you mentioned, through uh, April and May or sorry, April and March. And then in May and June, people sort of just went out and consumed in droves. Uh, we were at a point in June where. Retail sales are actually up on a year-over-year -year basis and above their level in February. So we were just due for a pullback. Uh, in a lot of the other parts of the economy, you're still seeing this uh, post-pandemic rebound. Um, there was just never a case for that to be the case in retail. And I would just add that the flash estimate for July from StatsCan from the last report was 0 0.7. So those have a pretty good track record of, as to uh, being able to signal where we're likely going in the data. And I'm just going through that data as promised. And this always gets a little complicated. I mean, even if you think about the e-commerce market, which StatsCan does track, but are we really capturing every piece of retail right now? I do want to highlight, Andrew, and hopefully it'll inform your opinions on, on what we've just learned, some of the specific sector news. So I mentioned the car numbers, one to look to. Motor vehicle sales, um, auto parts dealers as well. So those were encouraging signs. And even at gas stations, I mean, if more people were on the road in July as they were, you would expect that that activity would pick up. It looks like um, building material and garden equipment activity um, was a bit weaker. Um, I wonder if that's just the fact that, you know, you get into the middle of the summer, a lot of people have started working on some of those home reno projects already. They maybe got their garden supplies earlier on. Certainly you saw that reflected in the numbers for June. And then sales of clothing, clothing accessory stores, uh, they were up. So for the third consecutive month, about 11%. Uh, we certainly saw some shopping malls reopen. Um, I, I guess that's one of the big questions right now. When it comes to what you can do as a retailer, how much can you capture um, of lost sales just with all the restrictions that on some levels are still in place? Uh, absolutely. And I think what will be particularly interesting to watch as we get into the fall and perhaps we get a little bit more sensitive about um, you know, contagion as, as, as consumers. So I think one of the things you've seen in almost every economy in the world is after the initial uh, shutdown, people were very um, cautious in terms of respecting social distancing and maybe limiting trips they needed to make outside to the bare minimum. And then as people get more comfortable, and in Canada's case, the weather got better, uh, more and more people were out you know, on the roads, participate in the economy. It is a worry I have that just given some of you know this little uptick we've seen in in new infections in Canada in the last few weeks, that perhaps people may pull back a little bit on their their willingness to go out and again participate economically, uh, particularly with um, you know CERB coming to an end pretty soon and hopefully transitioning to the CRB, which is just a tad less generous. So, I mean, again, retail activity has fully recovered to the point it was at before the crisis. We shouldn't really expect big increases in, from here. Um, but I, mm. I do think it's something to watch for if people remain as, a, as comfortable uh, engaging in retail activity going forward. Well, just looking at these numbers and using a city like Toronto as an example, I mean, for, for the province of Ontario overall, you saw a relatively modest month-over-month -month increase in the sales activity. It looks like it was less than half a percent. But then for Toronto, because a lot of doors were reopening, that number was a lot closer to 4%. So cities being able to stay open obviously can have quite a dramatic effect on the retail story. So much so, at least if you look at the July numbers, that even though e-commerce activity, according to StatsCan, was up more than 60% year over year. I mean, we all know that story. We got Amazon boxes arriving every day. The percentage of retail sales that was coming from e-commerce in July ended up falling back a little bit, which makes a lot of sense, right? Doors were reopening, people were getting back out, so they weren't basically press and click on, on just about every purchase. W what do these changes, though, for the way by which we shop and how we've been influenced by the pandemic mean for you as an economist, what you're gonna be watching for to try to figure out how healthy the consumer is as we head into this fall period? 
I don't know that the the e-commerce aspect changes necessarily what I'll be watching for. It maybe makes the the retail numbers a little bit less reliable, just because again I don't know that the the e-commerce dynamic is as well understood in, in just empirically as the the bricks and mortar retail is in terms of how you know it will you know function cyclically, right? But I, I think fundamentally, what's going to be important is just. Are consumers confident enough? And I don't mean from a virus perspective. I mean just from a personal finances perspective. Are consumers going to be confident enough to continue spending at current levels as we go into the fall, um, and as you know, perhaps the recovery becomes a little bit more choppy and uneven? Um, you know, you do see a lot of notes of caution uh, from the Bank of Canada and around the world that you know perhaps the next stage of the recovery will be more uncertain. Um, you know, certainly if you look at the fact that disposable incomes have been supported largely by transfers, which are going to become a little bit less generous next month, that is reason to see and how uh, consumers will respond. And also the fact that a lot of people had mortgage deferrals for the last six months. People are going to have to start making mortgage payments who had been able to defer them starting in October. And that's something that will be a drain on disposable income. So there are some headwinds hmm. coming up here. So as we wrap things up, because another dominant theme we started talking about this week, we, we've heard from some people who watch the debt market who have a strong belief that Canadians who have relied pretty heavily on loans uh, over this last decade are going to be uh, once again leaning on those um, as the economic story becomes uncertain once again, as some of those emergency aid programs change, as you alluded to earlier, as we're just not quite sure what the jobs market's gonna look like, and we add to all of that, the fact that interest rates have been so low, and so that access to capital has been attractive to a lot of people. So I think interest rates are gonna remain low for quite a long time. I mean, you've heard that from the Bank of Canada. If you look at what bond markets are pricing, there's almost no chance of hikes. Uh, the Bank of Canada has been very reactive to any sort of nascent weakness in the long end of the curve, uh, supporting longer term borrowing from the government of Canada through their QE programs, they're buying provincial bonds. We should be in a low interest rate environment for at least the next few years. So I think just in that sense, we don't have the near term risk of these more indebted households suddenly facing big increases in their debt servicing costs, which is which is a good thing from the household perspective, at least over the short and medium term. Um, you know, in terms of people racking up debts, I guess from my perspective right now when I look at Canada, I'm most interested to see if this housing dynamic continues, because I think most people, if you had told them in April that we were going to be going into a blockbuster summer for the housing market, they would have been very surprised and perhaps a little bit scornful. I remember talking to people and saying I wasn't sure house prices would fall that much and being laughed at a little bit derisively, and it turns out I was far too conservative, not far too optimistic. So. I think it'll be there's an interesting scenario that emerges where if we keep rates at these levels for the next few years, which is almost certainly going to be the case, I think that's a consensus view. Uh, and the Canadian household continue Canadian households continue to borrow at these levels, we could wind up back in a scenario that we were at, you know, eight years ago or uh, thereabouts, where the Bank of Canada suddenly becomes worried about their low rates fueling a uh, if not a housing bubble, uh, perhaps. Um, increases in house prices that are concerning. So it, it's sort of a strange time to be talking about, on one hand, a unprecedented recession, and on the other hand, the risk of a housing bubble, but here we are. <laughs>